know, I just spend time with him before we even get started to sit in his lap, give him a kiss on the cheek, just the intimacy of worship. It's not just songs and music. It's, it's being able to say things and, and songs of the Lord that are much more eloquent than how we speak. It makes it kind of exciting for a guy that talks like Rocky. You'll go, no, you'll do it, you know. Um, <laughs> to be able to uh, worship the Lord like that is so exciting to me. And to hear the voices uh, united like that, all of heaven hears that one, we get to do that. And then the study of the Word of God, to know the Bible, to know what the Bible says, not what, not what society says, not what the world says, not what sports figures say or actors or anything else. It's what God says that's important in the world that we live in. And we know less and less of it. And this message in Corinthians, if you've been following along with this, I call the book of the Corinthians the naughty church. And, and it just is. These people are going to church, but they don't act like Christ. Um, they look more like the world than they do Christ. And it's sad to see, and Paul, Paul started this church, and, and, and he birthed it, and he, and, and he left to birth other churches, and then all those reports come back to him of the stuff that's going on in the church. And they're fighting, they're bickering, they're, they're fighting for power. They're, they're, um, they have these feasts where they, they bring food and everyone shares a meal, and the rich people are eating all the food before the poor people can get to it. They're, they're, they have these gifts from God, and they're bragging about the gifts and showing off the gifts from God. And you see all this stuff with church, but human nature is drawing it more than God is. And it's the worst thing we can do as Christians is look like the rest of the world. They may want us to, but we're not to be that way. We are to be separate. We are to be set apart. And when we look like the world, then they confirm that it's okay to look that way. And so that's just something that's very common. When you became a Christian, you were called to be set apart, to be different than what the world is. And, and when I say the world, I mean the world's ideas, the thoughts that go on. Now, just teaching what God says compared to what the world says is getting more and more difficult every day. Um, they consider it hate crimes and, and the nonsense that goes on with the people that are in positions of authority in our schools, in our colleges, in our government. And you see the wickedness of what's being put before us. And they've done a really good job of getting in places of power. And we have to be careful. And as a pastor, I have to be careful. You don't stand here, beat the pulpit, and say, these are bad people, these are bad people, these are bad people. These are people that God loves. But God does not love sin. And just because society has accepted that sin is okay does not mean that God does. If God changes and God is different in what he's told us, what do we hold on to? You know, if there's not a stand, the Bible tells us very clearly that he does not change his mind. What he said was for us back then is still for us today. Because otherwise, we'll never know what's right or wrong. He's a God that's made things very simple so that you and me can follow it. But in the world we live in, it's getting harder and harder to be able to speak God's truth in the society that we live in. Now, these Corinthians, we're in 1 Corinthians 5. These Corinthians were not much different than what we see going on in many, many churches today. You know, many churches today feel like if you want to reach the world, you have to look like the world. And that's a lie we from the pit of hell. Again, we have been called by God to be holy and set apart. We are called to be different. Now, being different is not easy. It doesn't go with the flow. Now, even as carnal and worldly as this culture was in the Corinthians, the entire city the ungodly are talking about the member of the church there. And that's what's sad because 
People that have gone to this church for years and years and years that I know have never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of their lives. You can see it in the way that they live and the decisions that they make. Now, none of you, you guys are all perfect. But there are people, and there are people that look outside and say, well, they go to that church, man, they're supposed to be holy, they're supposed to be righteous, they're supposed to be right. And they blame Christianity, but it's not Christianity's problem. It's the person that's not living the life that God's called us to live. Just because you walk into a building called a church does not mean that you live for Christ. Um, there's this person that's going, living in this immoral lifestyle. And what he is is a, a young man sleeping with his stepmother. We don't know all the details about it, but Paul addresses that in the Bible. And it's flat out just sin. Now, society has now said, well, that's okay, just like society says many things that we see today that are going on that are okay in society's mind, but not God's. And the world loves to see a Christian that's failing. The world loves to see a Christian that's failing. The world loves to see a Christian that's drunk or stoned or swearing, lost their temper, because then they justify their own behavior. You know, we're either going to be a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Everyone will be a slave to something. I choose Christ. Nothing else makes sense. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Paul says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. He's writing this letter to them. Something that even the pagans don't do. I'm told that that man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Now, if we were to remove people in the fellowship that ever sin or fall short, you can start with me. You know, I, everyone falls short. Everyone sins. Sin is, the word sin means perfection, never making a mistake. None of us are that good. We all fall short. But there's a difference between sin and willful sin. Willful sin is saying, I know what you say, God, but I don't care. I'm going to do it anyhow. That's transgression. That's a sin that's totally different than slamming your finger with a hammer and letting a word come out that you haven't heard in years. You know, we all do dumb things. We all do things we can regret. You know, we all wish that we hadn't done. We all fall short. We don't want to. I would love never to make a mistake. But I do, and, and so do you. But a person that willfully transgresses, knows what God says, knows what the Bible says, and is going to do it anyhow, that's a different situation, and Paul talks about it. These Corinthians, this church, is so puffed up, they're proud. They're proud of their tolerance for sin. They thought of themselves wiser than they were. They thought they were so with the times. They're so proud of their tolerance for what's going on. And Paul tells them that they should be ashamed of what was openly going on in the church. I have found the most difficult person to deal with is the kind of person that, that is blind to their own sin, and yet they see everyone else's. They can point at everyone else in the church and what they're doing wrong, but they don't see themselves doing anything wrong. I find them the most difficult people to talk to, to counsel, to work with. And I've told you the hardest person I have with sharing Christ is the person that feels like they're better than everybody else, so they deserve heaven. They've used everybody else as their standard for what God wants. You see, everybody else is not the standard. God is. Verse 3, even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And though I were here, as though I were here, there, I've already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. 
then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day of the Lord's return. Wow, that seems pretty harsh. Here's this guy sinning and you're going to throw him out of the church? Well, there's, there's more to this. Paul's instruction to the Corinthians was that they were to deliver this man in the hands of Satan. Why would you do that? Well, it's not for damnation, but for restoration. In order that his flesh would be destroyed and his spirit would be saved. Now see, after rejecting the counsel of the elders, this is what you must do, Paul says. Stay away from this person. This person that refuses to leave the sin in their life. They leave the chance of joy and peace and the covering of the church body. Sometimes the world has to be allowed to beat you up enough for you to say, I'm done with this. There are people that hear this is going to cause you damage and they go, okay, then I won't do that. I remember my dad owning an athletic club growing up and going to the gym, you know, at 16 years old and working out at the gym and being around all these 19 and 20 year olds and 21 year olds and the stories that they told about drugs and alcohol and there was one guy that had lost his arm. He had overdosed and slept on the arm for days and killed the circulation of the arm and removed his arm and he was an incredible bodybuilder, handsome man, his whole life has changed. And I remember listening to those guys talk about their stories and went, I'm going to stay away from that. It just made sense to me. You know, I have an addictive personality. Bring me, bring me a piece of pumpkin pie and I'll show you. <laughs> I have an addictive personality. I knew that that addiction would be something that would destroy me. I saw that. I didn't want to deal with that. I didn't add that into my life. I had watched many people in my family die of alcoholism. I thought, man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take a chance in that. I'm not going to allow that to have my life. You know, I watched people that couldn't quit smoking. I thought, ah. I'm not even going to bother to try that. I was just one of those people. But there are people that say, I don't care. I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it. And then to get them out of that, it has to become so difficult because that rockhead personality that can be used so mightily when it's given to the Lord, that rockhead personality just destroys them. And, and, and there are two different kinds of people handling things two different ways. Both of them can have victory in Jesus Christ. Now, I have watched people with terrible addictions allow Jesus to be Lord of their life, and they take all that passion that was destroying them, and they take it and use it for the kingdom, and there's nothing like them. And they've turned, they've repented, and they've gone in a different direction. God always wins when you give him your life. He always wins. He can take all the garbage and all the nonsense and everything you've ever done wrong, and he can use it. I've watched people want to save people that were in the same lifestyles that they were in, and they have a passion that I can't even get close to. And God uses that person that way. Now, hopefully, you know, with prayer, they'll come sick of this sin. Hopefully, with love and prayer, and the law for the days where they fellowship with the church body, had the community, the true love, the friendships. Now, as we see in Paul's second letter, when we get to in 2 Corinthians, uh, the Corinthian church did what Paul told them to do. And it worked so well that Paul later was to instruct them to welcome this brother back into the church. You know, when we talk about The father with the two sons and the one child rebels and the other kids just faithful and the one child finds himself in a pit of mud feeding pigs and for a Jewish person just being around a pig was degrading and he, he's looking at a piece of corn in the slop and he's so hungry he wasted his father's inheritance he he, he did everything wrong and he remembered a time when life was better. And he comes humbly back to the father asking for forgiveness. And the father runs to him. This prodigal son, the father runs to him, puts a robe back on him, 
puts a family ring back on him and puts him right back into where he was. See, sometimes that's what God has to do with us. Sometimes we have to find ourselves in the pit, beat up by this world, because this world will beat you up. And remember a time that life was better, a time where you were in God's grace. And when you come back to the Father, he runs to you because it's his desire. You know, there's this thing I read about. They say if you have a dog that eats chickens, you can't stop him. He'll eat chickens from now on. But somebody found a way to stop him. And that was to hang that carcass around that dog's neck until that carcass got so stinking, filthy, nasty, smelling, rotting that it made that dog so ill that after that time in that dog's life, it would never get near another chicken. Some of us have had to be in a lifestyle that it took that kind of rotten to finally turn us. And if you're there today, how much stink are you gonna put up with before you get right with God? He can't wait to remove that off of you. He can't wait to bathe you. He can't wait to put you back in his arms. It's painful for a parent to watch a child that wants to live in destruction. It's probably one of the most painful things I can think of. And it's hard for a parent to go cut or not cut off that piece of chicken so that child doesn't have to put up with a steak. But the problem is sometimes we get in the way of what God's trying to do. We never stop loving a person that's stinking. But we sometimes have to stay away and let the stink change them. It's important for the church to understand that. It's important for parents to understand that. We don't serve each other well or our children well by allowing them to live in willful disobedience and sin. There comes a point when a person needs to turn over to turn them over. Let's say let the world beat them up and then see if they'll come around. Now, we can't be flippant about turning someone away from the church and send him to say there's only been one person that I can think of ever that I told had to leave the church because he was doing damage to the females in our church and the body and would not repent and continue to do that and so for protection of the church I had to tell that person until they repented until they got right they could not come back and you know what it broke my heart I never wanted to be a pastor to tell somebody they can't come to church. I still pray for this person. I still wait for the opportunity and hope to see this person get things right. Now, there's a couple steps that have to be in place, and people don't always understand why you have to turn somebody away because they don't know all the details. But believe me, there's no one that ever got turned away that there wasn't every opportunity for them not to have that happen. First thing in turning some way over to say it must be done from the instruction from the Word of God and based on actions, nothing short of scriptural and biblical authority. Second, turning someone over to the Lord must be done with much prayer and church authority. Because any one person or small group of people can be vulnerable to things seen through the bitterness of the eyes. It must be done in the power of Jesus Christ with the confirmation of the leaders of the church. Gratefully, it's only had been done once so far and I hope it never has to be done again. I'm always hoping that grace and love and kindness can win. But with some people, sometimes that isn't enough. Verse six, you're boasting about this, this you're boasting about this is terrible. You don't realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. Now Paul is using an illustration here. Yeast is what causes bread to leaven or rise. It's not easily seen initially, but it becomes obviously eventually. 
It's the perfect symbol for evil. It's used throughout scriptures. It starts out with just a little tiny thing and then grows and grows and grows. It says, get rid of your old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival. Do not, not with old bread or the wickedness of evil, but with new bread of sincerity and truth. This word sincerity here was used in making script, um, stone sculptures. And the artist sometimes would have an accident, lop off a finger. And so what does he do? He's got the whole sculpture done and the finger drops off. So what they would do is they would get wax and particles of the grinding and they would mix it together and then they would pair the finger on the sculpture. So sincerity meant without wax. And so it meant pure, not messed up, no sin. Now the day before Passover was called a day of preparation, in which the Jews would get rid of their homes, every trace of leaven, or they used it as a picture of sin. And it was in preparation for the Passover six day feast of unleavened bread. Paul throws this well unknown, this well known understanding for a call of recommitment to holiness and purity in the part of the Corinthian church. They would understand very clearly what he was trying to say. This picture is also for us, you know, to leave the world that we live in. Now that doesn't mean you go away or fly to another planet, but leave the way the things of the world are. And we do it through the blood of our Passover lamb, Jesus. He shed that blood for us on the cross so that we could be seen without sin, without leaven. So let's be faithful because of what he's done for us. Let's live without sin. Let's live without leaven. Without the secret sin that ends up rising up and spreading throughout our whole entire fellowship, it harms everyone in the body. Verse 9. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. The Greek tense of this passage makes it clear that we're to cut off some relationships in our lives. Now we're not talking about people that have fallen into or struggle with these sins, but the ones who knowingly and continually practice them. Why? Because the first reason is to correct the wrongdoing. You know, if a tumor's growing in my body, no competent doctor would say, I'm not gonna operate on you because I don't wanna be harsh with you. I know you don't like needles. You know, that, 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 there's just no way. And that's exactly what we say to believers who are caught up in sin, when we fail to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord, and show them where they've wrong in love. Never pointing a finger. You know, when you point a finger at somebody, you got three wiggling right back at you. In love. In love, you can say things to people that you could never say when you're pointing a finger at them. The challenge is, is we begin to think and talk like those that we spend a lot of time with. Who you hang out with is who you will be. It, it just does. It rubs off the language, the thoughts. That's why mom and dad, protect your children. Know who they're hanging out with. You were called to be their best friend. You were called to be their protector. Adults, you want to hang around drunks? You want to hang around partiers? You want to hang around filthy language? Guess what? It rubs off. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't ever spend time with them, but you spend time on your terms, not theirs. Verse 10. But I was talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin, who are greedy or cheap people, or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. He says, I'm not talking about worldly people, because where would you go if you weren't going to be around people that act like the world? <laughs> we live in the world. He's talking about Christians that are acting like the world, so it's important to understand who he's speaking to. 
He basically says you would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin or greed or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove, remove evil people from among you. Um, I wonder about this when I read this. Why didn't Paul address the stepmother? He addresses the boy, but he doesn't address the stepmother. And I think what it is is that she was probably a non-believer. He's saying, judge a believer. In, in, in wickedness and sin, but a non-believer, that's for God to take care of. We as a church did not run around and have to judge the non-believer. And I, I mentioned that's why we don't see Paul judging the stepmother in this sexual sin. He is talking to the Christian that's supposed to be acting like a Christian. You know, there can be a tendency on us to be wanting to judge the world all the time. It's not hard to do when you look at the world we live in. But there are people that are so busy judging the world, they're not judging their own congregation, the people within God's church. When we talk about the world's sin, it's so easy to take a blind eye upon ours. If we look at the world for the standard, we feel like we're pretty good, don't we? You know, we feel pretty good about ourselves when we look at the world the way they lived. But again, the world is not the standard. God is. When I look to God, I'm ashamed of my human nature. And it's only the blood of Christ in my life that helps me to know that God doesn't see the ugliness that's inside of us. I think um, a trap that we fall into as parents and leaders is that we can think that if it's tough on someone, that person will completely fall apart. And, and the fear. We have um, children now. They're claiming that they want to die, that they want to take their lives. Um, life has got very, very difficult for our children. And there's a lot of them that are so overwhelmed. COVID did more damage than the disease. It did a lot of mental damage to our children. And we can be so afraid of those threats that we allow behavior to be overlooked. So we have to be very careful in how we handle things. It's gotta be done in a lot of prayer. It's gotta be done in a lot of love. My mom was tough. She was five foot two, and boy, I would not mess with her. I used to laugh all the time because I told all my friends I had these half moon marks on my forehead, and they were from her high heels. <laughs> um, I couldn't get away with anything. I mean, nothing. She hunted me down no matter. I even thought about doing something wicked. She was on it, man. She died. Oh, it was, she was tough. But the one thing that my mom did was that I always knew that the toughness and the difficulty and the punishments and the arguments, that she loved me. And she never stopped telling me that, even when I was getting the half moon marks. She really never did that, but I, I, I tell her church that they did just to get to her. But she scared me. Um, I knew. I may not have liked what she was telling me, it wasn't what my flesh wanted, but I knew that the motive and what she was doing was in love. And so that's what we have to be careful, because we have to remove anger. Because anger doesn't accomplish anything, and we have to do it, but we have to stay tough, and we have to stay tough in love.
has lived the world we live in. I see less and less people that want to live godly lives. That's something way bigger than me. I can't fix the world. I wish I could. I wish I could. I pray for it. All I can do is live the most godly life I know how. And speak the truth in love. And that's what it's called to be light in the world. And it's a world that's getting darker by the moment. The advantage of being light in the world and a world that's getting darker by the moment, the darker the room, the brighter the light. When we start to show the baptism, guys fell asleep over there on turning the lights off. And with all the light in the room, you could hardly see the screen. But when the lights went down, the screen became more vivid, more, more, more visible. And that's the world as it gets darker. And the Bible tells us that the world gets darker. It's not a surprise. But as difficult as it is, when we are light, we really do have a, a more brilliance to our life. We've been told by God through the book of Revelation how this turns out. And as human race rejects God more and more, it should be no surprise to see what's going on with the human race. We cannot get distracted by ungodly people and forget to live as holy people. We are set apart. We're set apart to help God in this. We've been called to do that. As the worship team comes up, this Corinthian church looked more like the world than they did like Christ. And what saddens me You guys, I wanted, when me and Val left Livermore and came to Discovery Bay, and then helped out to build the Livermore Church, um, we really just wanted to go to church somewhere. We just really wanted to sit down and listen to a pastor teach the Word of God worship the Lord, help put some chairs away. If they needed some help somewhere, be there. But after 20 something years, we really just wanted to find a church that we could go and, and somebody, I didn't even care if the guy explained the Bible. He could have just got up there and read a chapter and done worship and not have gone to that church. And we started visiting churches. We went to one church where the guy had a robe on with every glittery thing you could see and he beat on the pulpit and they asked for money 12 times and, 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 and they were yelling at everybody. We went to church where they wouldn't even open the Bible. We, were, we, we just wanted to go to a church where the Word of God was being taught and rest. Now we couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. And it broke my heart. And so I started a study in, in my home. And, and, and then our house filled up. <laughs> then we got the little Excelsior classroom and 100 people showed up. And then the Catholic Church moved out. And, and, and we just wanted to do what I was so desperate to do is I wanted to learn the Word of God from the Word of God. Not from some guy's opinion, just wanted them to go through the Bible and tell me what the Bible said. I didn't want his opinion. I wanted God's opinion. I wanted to worship the Lord without somebody screaming or bouncing or yelling or getting out of control where you're paying more attention to that person than you are the worship. I just wanted to find something like that, and, and we couldn't. And so that's how this church birthed. It started out with a home fellowship, and other people found the same thing and the same desire. As churches start to look more like the world, where's the light going to come from? Where's the light going to come from? Um, what we do here is not going to be popular. It's not going to fill coliseums. Many churches can't defend because if they do, then they don't get givers. 
and so they can't pay the bills. They get these extravagant buildings that everybody wants, but somebody's got to pay for them. And so they skip the things in the Bible that are controversial. Look, if we're going to pick and choose what we want in the Bible and leave everything else out, we're wasting our time because we don't know what God has to say then. Do I enjoy speaking on things that the world doesn't want to hear? No. I'd rather tell you about the stuff that's fun in the Bible and the things that are cool. There's so many people that have churches to go to that say, if you want help and wealth, all you've got to do is come to church and be a nice person, bless your heart, give them pay. And, and people are filling coliseums with that kind of nonsense. And I listen to it, I just want to scream. I want to grab by the throat. And that's where I have to really realize that I still sin. But to misrepresent God that way, what happens when a godly person gets a cancer? What happens when a godly person loses money? What do you do with that? What happens when someone dies? What do you do with that kind of nonsense that we watch filling coliseums? Now look, I'm not preaching on every church that's in the world. There's some great churches doing great things. But it's getting harder and harder than the world we live in. Paul is forced to set this church that he loves with his whole heart, was willing to die for. When you see the history of what we've taught, they wanted Paul's life. They were trying to kill him everywhere, sharing the gospel. The religious people of the day were trying to kill him for sharing the gospel. And he did everything, he gave up everything to, to share the truth with God. He's not going to turn his head and say, well, that's okay. Well, we call it love now, so it's all right. Even though God says it's not, clearly, in his word, as long as we call it love, it's okay. Now, I'm offending some of you. I'm offending some of your friends right now. But that's what truth is. Love someone enough to lovingly set them straight. Because anything else is an atrocity. Any pastor that gets up and will not teach God's word, it's an atrocity. This, this Corinthian church that we're going to be going through the rest of the book, it, it really does a great job of showing humanity. Um, but it also gives us the answers. It really does. It, it, it's a good one to line things up with. Would you stand with me? Now. Why should we? The thought in your mind, why should we give up all of this stuff for our flesh now when we can have it? When we can get away with it? Think about your very best day on the face of the earth. The very best day that you've had. In a wife, a new car, a new relationship. Nothing this world has compares to what God has waiting for those that are faithful. And it's not for just a car or a relationship or a wife. It's for eternity. Never have sorrow, to never have pain, to never spread a tear, to spend eternity with a father that loves you and desires to be with you and has made this offer to you. What does this world have that you can't dump for sin when that's waiting for you? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be so sweet and tender. Father, quiet us down, please. So much information, so much going on. Keep our minds numb, Lord. When our minds are supposed to be kept upon you. Don't let us get up in the morning. Don't let our feet touch the ground until we as Christians ask for you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, enabling us to look like you and not the world. We need you in that, Lord. I know that we have the responsibility to obey, but you have promised the power to do it. We ask that in your precious name.
God bless you guys.